Hi, um, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for the introduction and, and a very warm welcome to everyone to this session. Um, as Thomas said, this is really a three-part um, uh, program now on, on public debt and fiscal spending. This first one uh, being sort of the scene setting and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the general panel. So one of my job as chair is to remind everyone not to cannibalize the later sessions too much, which talk about fiscal rules in Germany in specific detail and um, uh, on, on Europe's fiscal rules. I know it's a lot of fun to talk about these rules, but for this one, for this session, we want to take a, a broader view. Um, and we have two fantastic speakers to introduce our session for uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Two of my favorites, really, um, as they always manage to make you think in uh, and to take a fresh look at what you thought you understood well. So um, I, I'm really glad that, that both could join us. Um, Mark Blythe, um, he's a professor of international economics at uh, Brown University in the US, though his accent will immediately give away where he's originally from. Um, and we should consider ourselves lucky, I've read, uh, that the world has, was not quite ready for his kind of music when he was a young man, uh, because until the age of 28, he happened to be a musician before he became a professional academic. Um, and now he writes books uh, with such charming titles as Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea, and Angrynomics, Analyzing the Cause of, um, of the West, this West Current Mood. And this second book he did not write alone, but with uh, our second speaker, Eric Lonegren, who is a macro fund manager, economist, and author, for example, of the book uh, Money and Why Central Banks Should uh, Have a Helicopter. Um, I'm not quite sure about your uh, musical talents there, Eric, uh, but his speaking talents are, are undisputed, I think. And so after this introduction of, of 10 to 15 minutes uh, by those two, uh, we have discussions with us to, to, um, to, to discuss the findings that, or the proposals that they, that they suggest. One is uh, Peter Bofinger, well known in Germany as the former member of the German Council of Economic Experts and a professor at Würzburg University. Uh, then we have Maria de Mertzis. Uh, she is the deputy director of Bruegel in Brussels, the economic think tank. Then we have Jakob von Weizsäcker, the chief economist of the German uh, finance ministry, uh, and formerly also with the Bruegel affiliation and uh, former member of the European Parliament. Then, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Veronique is here. Fantastic. Uh, Veronique Riches Flores, an independent economist and former uh, chief economist of Societe Generale. Um, and um, with that, I think, or not. Uh, Christian, just uh, just to to uh, to a little correction, uh, Marie, uh, Veronique is there for my, uh, Maria, so it's uh, Maria de, Ma de Maertz is, uh, couldn't join. So, um, oh, apologies. Just in order not to miss her later in the discussion. Oh yeah, that would be awkward if I if I call her up to discuss this. Um, well, then Maria will be with us next time. Um, so this is going to be a fun hour. Um, Eric and Mark, very excited to hear your input. The floor is yours for 10, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And, and, and I'm sure I can speak on Mark's behalf in this regard, which I will do very rarely. But just to say thank you for the organizers, we really, really appreciate it. And to, to Thomas in particular, and to all of you for taking the time to, to consider our thoughts. Um, and I should preface what we are saying here is, is as much about, uh, you know, being participants on a journey rather than claiming to have the answers. Uh, and the idea here is really to, to, to engage in our collective thinking and wisdom to try and, and, try and work out uh, what we are doing and what we should be doing. If it's okay, I'm going to share my screen and just go through four or five slides. They're hopefully just a, a clear exposition of what we've been thinking about. And then I'll hand over to Mark um, to give, to give uh, some sort of political economy context uh, on these arguments that we're making. So. Great. So can I just confirm you you can see that okay, Christian, the prudence principle. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so one of the things I think is very important um, when considering fiscal rules or a fiscal framework is actually, first of all, to be honest about uh, the fact that our beliefs appear to have changed rather dramatically. Um, and to be clear about precisely why those beliefs have changed. 
Um, so if, if I take uh, Olivier Blanchard as, as, and I'm going to sort of unfairly use him as an example throughout this, this presentation, to me, he sort of typifies the collective journey, which was having been a, a proponent and indeed a designer in many senses of, of fiscal rules, has gone from one extreme of saying we should have fiscal rules, which are all predominantly based around sustainability equations, where sustainability equations are largely about saying, based on certain sets of assumptions, it makes sense to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. That's the kind of core of all fiscal rules to date, um, has now gone to the other extreme, which is really saying, mm, I, 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 I'm now fully in the camp of discretion and th the world is too complex to have a fiscal rule. And so we, we need bodies of, of wise people uh, men and women in order to work out what the way forward is. Now that feels to me, first, first of all, I think we need to be really clear about why have people gone on that journey? So what has actually precipitated that shift? Um, because I think by analyzing that question uh, in of itself is actually very, very revealing. Um, I, I should also express it up front. I am uh, very, very unhappy about that dynamic in a way. Um, or, or I certainly think it's also very, very difficult uh, when we are trying to establish credibility with policymakers and the general public more broadly to make shifts of that nature, because you then face the obvious question, which is, um, why should I trust your current wisdom in the context of the fact that your prior wisdom seems to have shifted um, so substantially? Okay, so why has everybody changed their mind? Um, it's actually really clear. Um, and this, in a sense, Mark and I are really saying is the kind of conscious, unconscious rule that we are, in fact, all operating on. So in a sense, all that we're saying is, is let's be explicit about the principle that we're actually adopting. Um, and if we're explicit about it, that then already gives us a framework. And effectively what's happened is there's been a, a shift in the relationship of the, the real cost of debt um, to the government R relative to real rates of GDP growth. And in fact, this is most striking if you look at it globally. And again, it's worth just briefly rehearsing some of the history here, initially post the financial crisis. You know, many of us had been aware of the likes of Japan, of course, um, and other jurisdictions where interest rates were already extremely low. But there was a sense in which this collapse in real interest rate structures was, was becoming a global and more permanent force post the financial crisis. It's worth, though, as economists being honest about it. At the time, we thought that the decline in real interest rates was really telling us about prospective real rates of GDP growth. But it only started to slowly be understood that actually, no, there was something more profound happening, which was R was falling relative to the rate of real GDP growth. And in fact, if you look at global real GDP growth, including China, and you look at a global real interest rate, it's an even more striking picture. So actually, global real GDP is relatively stable on a 30-year view, largely because, of course, places like China's share of global GDP has been rising and offsetting the decline in rates of growth elsewhere. But R has just been kind of declining on a, on a global unrelenting basis. So why have we changed our minds uh, about fiscal rules is largely because that relationship has changed. Now, if we very briefly look at how that occurs and actually to his credit uh, in, his, in, in, in one of his most recent papers, uh, Blanchard is extremely explicit about this, and of course it follows from uh, the logic of a standard uh, fiscal rule, and I, I, I won't spend too much time going through this because most of you will be very familiar, but all, all of this is showing here is how effectively the change in the debt GDP ratio um, is, which is B being the ratio of, of debt to GDP, um, the change in the, in the rate of debt to GDP is a function of your starting point level of debt to GDP, so debt at T minus one. Um, that then is, is going to be influenced by the relationship. The, the, the primary um, factors that are determining that are effectively the sign of R minus G. Um, and you realize that if uh, R is lower than G, one can effectively run persistent primary deficits 
um, in, in a manner which um, debt is still sustainable the way we think about it. So it just f falls out as a matter of um, the mathematics. Now, the interesting point, and I've taken a quote here from Blanchard, um, he is effectively saying our assumption was that it was positive. Um, and as a result, we designed fiscal rules that one of the consequences of which was that we needed to have primary surpluses. And he's very explicit that this very much underlay the construction of the EU rules. And it's still the way many observers and policymakers think about debt sustainability, but the environment has steadily changed. So, um, and, and in fact, in his paper, he goes on to, to, to just illustrate these two regimes. So in, in a sense, you have one set of fiscal consequences if, if R is greater than G and another set of consequences if it's uh, below G. Um, now, I'll just very briefly, in terms of why real interest rates have collapsed, um, Thomas wanted me to include in this, you know, a huge amount of research has been done on this, and we're not going to add a huge amount to that. There are a couple of points, I think, that are left out of the research. Um, and I've given these very odd numbers. Apologies for that. I've only just realized that. Um, the, 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 the third one here, I think, uh, is, is a critical one. Um, which is, I do think, part of the reason real interest rate structures have declined has been monetary dominance itself. So if every time you have a recession, you cut interest rates, and in a sense, the way the system recovers is through higher levels of leverage, um, that itself, that process may cause your equilibrium interest rate, for want of a better term, to decline. Um, I, I, and another point I think that, that is worth being aware of is the risk properties of bonds. And again, I think this is something that isn't entirely understood and, and examined in the literature. But, the, but as a market participant, this is something I'm very aware of. If you think of a government bond in the 1970s was in fact a different asset to a government bond today, i.e. the risk properties and correlation properties were completely different in the same way that a Brazilian or a Turkish bond is still effectively behaves like a risk asset and, and adds to the risk of a portfolio. In the developed world, adding bonds to portfolios actually provides you with diversification and that affects inflation risk premium, but also importantly term premium. Um, now, the exception of course to this trend is this trend hasn't been universal. And I think it's, again, it's important to be clear as to why. We haven't seen uniform decline in real interest rate structures or indeed public sector debt behaving as safety assets uniformly. Because of course, during the Euro crisis, something happened that made them behave like risk assets. And that is still the case if I look at, for example, Italian government bonds and I look at their correlation properties. And this is something that we need to be aware of. And I think paying attention to correlation here is as important as level. Okay. so. What is the prudence principle? Well, what we're really saying is, is that um, you know we, we are sympathetic to adopting kind of what I would say as a mainstream fiscal rule, which is which is largely about and and I think the the Ren Lewis Porter's rule, which is referenced in our paper, is a very uh, good starting point where they're effectively saying you should you should deficit target and not debt target. You should look at rolling five year periods. Um, but they are, and you should treat CapEx differently to borrowing for current uh, expenditure. Those are all very sensible principles that should be embedded in any fiscal framework. Um, what, what they have that I think is very interesting is they have, they introduced the idea of a knockout. And really what we're doing is, is adapting that and going a little bit further. Now, effectively, their knockout says when you get to the zero lower bound, it was done for initially, but if you just think of it as the effective lower bound, you should have a knockout. So really what they're saying is use a conventional debt sustainability rule, um, which is premised around ultimately stabilizing debt GDP ratios, but one can design it intelligently, which is you know taking uh, rolling five-year averages and, and with those caveats that I've noted, um, but that you suspend effectively your rule when you're requested to do so by the monetary authority. That was what uh, Ren Lewis and Portis have advised. And you can absolutely see the logic, and this is kind of saying, well, monetary policy runs out of power. We need, now need fiscal policy. We can't constrain fiscal policy. What Mark and I have proposed is, uh, I, for a host of reasons, that's not entirely satisfactory, both from a democratic legitimacy standpoint, but also in a sense, you can debate the efficacy of monetary policy. It feels to us that that's a kind of too, too, 
uh, has a whole host of problems associated with it. But why don't we just why don't we just make the rule that we are effectively all using an explicit rule? So in other words, we say we, we, we want to have a rule based system because we don't want to abandon that. But the nature of the rule is completely different when R is greater than G than when R is lower than G. And essentially what I'm saying is you would have a conventional rule when R is greater than G, you'd have some variant of the ren lewis porters rule. But when R is lower than G, you have substantial fiscal space. In other words, you actually permit um, B to rise substantially. Um, so that is in essence the, the, the nature of the rule that we are proposing. And now it obviously is, is, calling it a rule is probably generous. It's really a, a framework for thinking about a rule. Um, but I'm happy with that because I, I do think um, we, we, we still need to be in the game. And Mark will come on to this of, of, of rule designation, but we do need to have clear frameworks. I'm just I'm, I'm not going to take much longer because I realize I'm, I'm already going over time here and I apologize. There are obvious challenges. How do you measure R? We've suggested move, using a moving average of a 10 year yield. What do you do if market interest rates abruptly change? Um, and, and also, what is your rule in the R less than G? So it's all very well to say, well, there's fiscal space when R is less than G, and we're going to permit increases in the, in the debt GDP ratio. But should we put some constraints, some intelligent constraints around this, for example, that the structural increases in debt should be to fund CapEx? I'm just going to conclude very quickly with some points that I think I, I'm very keen to get thoughts on from the, the discussants. Um, there's a, a critical issue in Europe is the one of enforcement. And I must say, I think that's one of the attractions of what Mark and I are imposing, because it is actually the real constraint. I mean, the real constraint on Italy is not the European Commission. It is the bond market and it is ultimately the spreads on BTPs. So um, in a way, I, our rule is quite attractive because you're just actually formalizing what is a constraint. And then you're in a sense freed of whether you have political capital or not, because it is the constraint. I've mentioned Mario Draghi's law of conditional safety. This is something I've written about in the past. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. How can your bond be risk-free, but be conditionally risk-free? Well, it is in Europe because it goes to, to QE eligibility. And I think this is something that's a very interesting point as to whether that should be made explicit. Two final points. One is there, there's a live issue in my view about whether governments should be hedging interest rate risk. So R, is of course the average interest rate on your stock of debt. And people keep on talking about, well, what if interest rates rise? Well, if I fully termed out my debt, I don't really care if interest rates have rised, uh, rise rather. And the final one is I think we actually do need to address preemptively rather than have to come back and try and uh, work this out retrospectively, is there's a fundamental error in global central bank design which has only come about, of course, by accident that we'd never really thought about, which is now uh, they are gonna have huge fiscal effects if they raise interest rates because of their balance sheets. And so I think there are ways to solve this. And the first one is we need to cut the, we, we should never have designed them like that. There should not be transfers from central banks to the fiscal authorities, certainly within the Eurozone, that makes no sense. These are just accounting challenges in my view. And I think another way to deal with this problem would actually be to have, a, have an, av an average interest rate using tiered reserves of zero. So the question just doesn't exist. But I think we actually need to break this whole point of the link between central bank equity and the sovereign, because otherwise we could, I can foresee a situation where we get ourselves into all sorts of problems where central banks are trying to raise interest rates and that then has consequences for fiscal policy, which is going to really, really raise the question of the democratic legitimacy of the central bank. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Mark, now Eric has taken uh, 10, of the 12, 10, 10 of the 12 time. minutes already. So what can you say to it? No, just kidding. But, uh, you know, just, <laughs> no, just I'm not conscious. Sure I'm, I'm just a bit conscious. No, it's fine, Eric. I think, it's conscious of time. I think it's important that we hear from the discussant, so I'm going to take very little time. I just want to make two points. The first one is how our thinking on this came about, which was by accident. And I think that's often a good sign. Essentially, what happened was if when we were doing the, the, the work for our book, Angrynomics, we recorded it as a series of conversations. And that was the original urtext for the book. And during that conversation, Eric thought up this rule. This actually happened in conversation. And we put it in the book and forgot all about it. And then people started to read the book and people started to talk about the Lonergan Blythe rule. And at one point I went to Eric and said, do we have a rule? 
And then Thomas came to us and said, you have a rule, you should write it up. So that's why we're here, because things happen by accident. But more than accident, what's been driving this for a long time, and let me put just a tiny bit of sort of political economy context in this, is Eric talks about a regime shift between R and G and being in two different worlds. Uh, what I did on the front end of the paper was to try and put that in context and suggest that that regime shift may be even bigger than we think. If you'll allow me for a moment, if I have screen share access, I want to show you just a couple of slides because that will save time. So here's the first one. And this was given to me in 2012. Can you guys see this? Could you go to full screen? Full screen. Just... Okay, yeah. Okay, got it. Boom. Can you got that? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, right. So I got this in 2012 from a Japanese economic researcher that used to work in the cabinet office. And this was their attempt to gauge real interest rates over the long run. And uh, as you can see, uh, it tells quite a story that essentially the 1970s is a bit of an aberration, that long run real rates had been falling for a very, very long time prior to this. And as someone who was raised in the intellectual period of the sort of the late 70s and 1980s and the, the focus on inflation is an ever present danger, this really hit home with me Then I always wondered if we were sampling one part of the distribution and generalizing from that in an unwarranted manner, that is to say, what if the regime that we take as normal is actually the exception and our rules are based upon exceptions? In which case then, if there's mean reversion in the system, then you're gonna have a problem because your rules are gonna be out of whack. And I think that's increasingly what we see. This was cleaned up, of course, in the famous Schmelzing paper from the Bank of England a couple of years ago, where if you basically take the noise out of this, if you see where my uh, cursor is now, that you can see from 64 to, to around 2000, that's the spike of the 70s. But that's largely noise on the long run real trends. And if you look at real rates decomposed by centuries, you see that steady downward trend. Now, what does all this suggest? It strongly suggests to me, if I can go back to here, it strongly suggests to me that there's a real possibility that we took that moment of the 70s, which was based upon, if you will, the unintegrated, non-financialized hothouse economies of the kind of Fordist period from the 40s to the 70s and generalize that as kind of the standard model, when in fact they were real exceptions coming out of the post-war settlement that blew up for their own internal contradictions. And what we see now is a kind of a mean reversion in, in, in all of these things, long-run real rates, inflation rates, etc. And we keep looking for that inflation. We keep looking for an inflation which effectively died in Europe sometime around 1987. And we don't want to get into the position that we did with Draghi in 2011, where we were raising interest rates twice in the middle of a crisis, because you can see an inflation which clearly isn't there. So if these rules have a purpose, at base, what I think it is, is this fear of the 1970s returning, the danger of inflation. But what if we are overestimating that? What if that is really not our problem? What if our problem is um, stagnant wages? What if our problem is the rise of populism? What if our problem is the, the fragility of democracy and the lack of faith that people have in the expert knowledge which we put out there into the world? And if we get it wrong again, if we have a chance to redesign these rules and we get it wrong again, then that could be very, very dangerous for the European project as a whole. So I think this is a very serious moment that encourages us to look out the window a little bit more and try and place what we're doing in a broader historical context. And that may lead us in a slightly different direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eric and Mark, for this for this presentation. Um, so I, I would like to go in the order of, of first Peter, then then Veronique, and, and last but certainly not least uh, Jakob, um, to give us their their view on sort of the the um, the new uh, consensus, as it were, on, on on public debt and what that means for practical fiscal policy making. Um, Peter, why why don't you start? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to discuss this paper because it's innovative and uh, at the same time, it has a very fascinating idea. And so let me share the screen. Where is it here? So, 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 oh, so can, oops, one moment. So, one second. So, can you see the screen now? Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay. So, let's start. Yes. So, um, what, is, what is the rule uh, that uh, Eric and Mike are uh, 
propagating. So I think it's very simple. I think that makes it fascinating. So it has two elements. If R exceeds G, target a stable debt to GDP role. If G exceeds R, uh, there is flexibility to pursue policies that uh, would require, sorry, to move, that would require increased borrowing. But the question is, First, what is the policy rule if G uh, is, exceeds R? So I think that's not very explicit in, in the paper. And a problem that I see, there is no mechanism that provides a stabilization of the debt to GDP ratio. Because if in situations uh, where R exceeds G, you have a stable rule. And when G exceeds R, you have the flexibility to increase the debt to GDP role. Uh, that would imply that uh, in the medium term, longer term, uh, that, uh, that the debt to GDP level is more or less without control. So I think that's something I have no found no answer in the paper. Um, and of course, uh, if you allow an increase of the debt to GDP uh, ratio without any uh, speed limit or without any limitation, there is a risk that once you come into a situation when R uh, exceeds G for a longer period of time, you get serious problems of, of uh, fiscal sustainability. So this is something maybe I've, I did not find in the paper, but what, what provides the stabilization of debt to GDP uh, over, over time? Um, and then the paper says, yes, um, the level of R is market determined, but of course it's also strongly influenced by the level of the central bank policy rates. You can see this here for the United States. Um, and this raises a problem uh, for the rule if central banks increase the short-term interest rates, with, which then also has a strong impact on the, on the longer-term interest rate. And I will show you this, this chart. So this chart shows longer-term development of the 10-year treasury constant maturity rate and cross domestic product. So they are both in nominal terms, so we would see the same picture in, in real terms. What you can see is whenever you have a recession, which are the shaded areas, um, the uh, interest rate exceeds the nominal growth rate. And this implies, if you apply the Lonergan Blythe rule, um, whenever you are in a recession, then fiscal policy is constrained because then it's not a, it has to stabilize uh, the debt to GDP ratio and is not allowed to do any substantial stabilization. So I think that's something uh, you have to have in mind, of course, the paper says there must be some kind of, of longer uh, average, but overall, I think there's a, a risk of uh, pro-cyclical fiscal policies. So in my view, um, I'm not so very much con convinced of, 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 this, of this rule, uh, but what I liked in the paper was uh, mentioning of functional finance um, as a basis for a fiscal policy rule and um, the main idea of functional finance or monet modern monetary theory, as I understand it, is there is no financial constraint for fiscal policy, but given that there is no financial constraint, there's always a real constraint for fiscal policy. And Abba Lerner makes it very explicit that the responsibility of the government is to, to, to maintain an equilibrium of aggregate demand and aggregate uh, supply in order to prevent inflation or unemployment. It's very interesting that the sentence that you have here is more or less identical with what you can read in section one of the German uh, Act on Stability and Growth. It's quite interesting. It's almost the same idea. So, so if you have this idea of functional finance and you ask, could this be the basis for a fiscal rule? Um, uh, the, um, the main idea is that whatever you do with fiscal, with fiscal policy is relevant for price stability and you get then an assignment for fiscal policy for price stability, which is, I would say, more or less absent in the standard discussions uh, on, on market economic policy. So once you have this uh, responsibility of fiscal policy for price stability, it's then quite interesting to ask what could be a kind of uh, framework for a fiscal policy that has a responsibility for price stability. And here, the idea is why not use inflation targeting, which we all know as a strategy for, fiscal, for monetary policy as a joint framework for fiscal policy and monetary policy. And if you apply this to the Euro area, 
Um, I, this chart, as I see it, gives you some very nice insights because the chart shows you that in 2013, 2014, inflation forecasts started to decline. They deviated downwards from the inflation target. So the, the framework shows here is the space for fiscal policy because we have trends in inflation to move downwards. At the same time, you could see here that monetary policy had reached this year low bound. And now applying this kind of uh, functional finance idea uh, to uh, fiscal policy would have made a very strong case for a strong fiscal uh, stimulus or for a strong fiscal space in order to do something against uh, the decline in, in the inflation rate. I think that would have been very helpful in the, in the euro area because it would have also avoided that the ECB uh, should, should, should the ECB goes goes into the negative terrain of interest rates. So I think applying this functional finance as a framework uh, for for fiscal policy and and uh, identifying a responsibility of fiscal policy for for inflation uh, opens very new ideas on on fiscal rules. So I don't have a fiscal rule available, but I think that's really helpful. And that leads to a final chart that I want to show you. Uh, you just discussed uh, reasons why um, real interest rates were so low uh, in, in, the, in the last decade. And I think one of the main reasons, which is normally not discussed, is that in, the, in this decade, uh, government uh, revenue, government spending was extremely low. So if you compare the blue bars with the orange bars, uh, the blue bars are 2001 to 2008, the orange ones 2011, 2018. And you can see the huge deceleration of, of fiscal policy in this period. And, in, and if, you, if you know that government spending is about 30% to 50% of GDP, this deceleration, in my view, must have had a strong impact on macroeconomic developments. In my view, a cause for secular stagnation, also for low interest rates. And I think the role of government spending for inflation must deserve a much greater role um, than uh, so far it, it has deserved. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Fascinating final chart as well. If you see the outlier in this chart, uh, notice Germany, where it has completely switched around from no growth to at least a little bit of growth. Um, but one, one word, the interesting thing is that all countries have now approached the German very low uh, increase in real revenue. That's quite interesting. So Germany yeah, has exactly. become the standard setup for the rest of the world, which was probably not a good idea for the world. Thank you. Excellent. Well, that fits perfectly to the theme of this conference. Um, Veronique, um, what, what is your take on, on, on what you've just heard and, 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 and Mark's and Eric's paper? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and, um, and thank you for the offer of, um, uh, of this paper which may, with a proposal which makes obviously sense for economists. Now, as I have only a few minutes to deal with this big issue of the fiscal framework, I have chosen um, a specific angle to address it. I have uh, looked at what is the situation today and what uh, um, the use of this rule would mean for fiscal policies in Europe and in European countries today, um, which, uh, as you all know, uh, when you speak about uh, complex uh, topics, uh, it becomes uh, a mess when you deal with Europe uh, for the same kind of question or same topic. So uh, looking at uh, nominal GDP for Italy over the last 10 years, we are uh, around 0.3% of nominal growth. Uh, against 1% um, government uh, interest rates today, on average over the last three years, it was 1.7%. The difference between nominal uh, growth or oh, interest rates and nominal growth is huge, which will mean Italy has to apply a very strict fiscal policy stance, a restrictive policy uh, to deal with such a situation. Um, looking to Germany now, the same uh, numbers, nominal GDP growth has been 
roughly 2.6% over 10, the last 10 years. Uh, interest rates are more or less at zero, slightly above 0% uh, uh, on average over the last three years, which would uh, suggest um, uh, with this rule that Germany has to uh, support a very loose uh, fiscal policy. Um, the France is between the two, as very often it is the case uh, with the French economy. What I, um, I think that uh, applying to Europe such a rule would be uh, raise a number of questions. Some of them have been already uh, um, suggested by Peter. Um, in the case of Europe, using such a rule will probably exacerbate the difference in the fiscal policy stance between within European countries, which I think is really uh, a key point uh, why uh, when looking to structural trends and divergences between European countries. Um, so we risk to exacerbate the structural uh, gaps um, between European countries instead of reducing them. Uh, risk to, of course, uh, exacerbate the negative sentiment on Europe and what is doing Europe or the constraint of uh, you coming from Europe and the different countries, uh, and especially amongst the weakest countries of the region. Uh, I think there's uh, a risk, as underlined by uh, Peter, a key risk of pro-cyclical policies uh, and a, a key risk to reduce the ability of government to deal with asymmetric shocks. How to use this rule if you are facing an asymmetric shock? I, I'm always in the European uh, area, so uh, looking differently to this uh, topic maybe, um, but it raises a key question. Are we, would it be uh, um, useful to use this rule. I think it, it will be uh, quite dangerous indeed uh, by uh, really reducing the, uh, the ability to smooth the economic trend and to, to, uh, to deal with the, uh, the crisis. So uh, I'm quite um, skeptical about the proposal, although, uh, as I said at the beginning, I welcome the proposal. It, it is such uh, evident um, that um, every economist is will be tempted to deal, to say, well, why not this uh, so simple solution? But I think uh, there are several risks. And finally, when I I think about uh, economic policy, whether fiscal policy or monetary policy, I usually think about both together. So the policy mix, and I think uh, with your proposal, we are missing something on that way. If, we, if you are weaker or low interest rates, it's usually because, especially in the current environment where central bankers are um, very uh, invasive, if I could say, uh, it's uh, usually because central banks are doing what we need to help the economy. If you take this uh, context of interest rates, uh, which is not specific, um, automatically a natural one, by using it for, uh, to de de define your fiscal stance, the risk is adding and to create some multiplier of a fiscal policy, which could be rather pro-cyclical or at the opposite, um, uh, very damaging for the economic situation. So I, I don't see how to use your proposal with no uh, major risk of reducing the efficiency of the, uh, the policy mix and uh, reducing the discrepancies uh, between European countries. That's my point. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique. And finally, Jakob, um, the uh, chief economist of the German finance ministry comes, you know, with that comes a bit of an affinity to fiscal rules at least. Um, but how about Martin and, and Eric's? Is there any chance uh, yeah, um, uh, many thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's a pleasure to listen to, 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 to Eric and Mark and, and, and of course, uh, Peter and, uh, and uh, Veronique. And I think it's fitting that uh, we start uh, um, a series of sessions on, on fiscal rules uh, um, with, uh, with Mark, uh, Eric's and Mark presentation. And, and, and the reason is not because I think their fiscal rules is what we're going to end up with. 
But um, uh, what I think is the real strength of, of your presentation, Eric and Mark, is, is the diagnostic end of things. And I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, changes in R minus G because of uh, very low interest rates, not because of very high growth rates, but of very low interest rates, that's a, a, an important change. And um, as Peter has elaborated a little bit, and, uh, and of course, Veronique as well, and the second aspect of these low interest rates, and they're in your title, of course, so as we can all see in times of low interest rates, is the zero lower bound and the problem for monetary policy at the zero lower bound. So, so um, if R minus G um, uh, uh, were uh, 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 um, uh, uh, positive, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, if, if R minus G were negative, uh, for um, uh, for a uh, um, for a, for an infinite period of time, um, of course, in the extreme, uh, we simply would not have to worry about any kind of uh, this constraint. That's obviously the, the case. We would have a sort of perfect chain letter, if you will, and it would work um, for obvious reasons, mathematically obvious. But um, as Peter has pointed out, and uh, um, uh, uh, um, there's no guarantee, and you acknowledge that, and it will last forever. That's why you have the second side of things. But if um, uh, um, governments act on the assumption that it will last forever, they could get themselves into trouble, even if, uh, frankly, the risk of, uh, of an interest rate reversal right now is not huge, uh, in, in, in Europe at least. Um, uh, it could happen. It's, it's a non-zero probability. Uh, so I think... Uh, um, uh, and maybe the, 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 the prudence that is implied uh, um, uh, in your rule could use some refining. And, and that's the first comment uh, I, 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 would, uh, I would make, uh, much in line with what Peter has said. And then I would make a second comment, uh, linked not to R minus G, but the zero low bound. Um, in, uh, say, the United States, if um, fiscal policy, uh, if fiscal policy feels that it needs to support monetary policy at the zero lower bound, then the federal government can simply say, okay, we step in, we, we do what, what we feel is necessary. In the euro area, that's more complicated. And um, one can come up with all kinds of fancy constructions, but in the end, um, one institutional constraint we'll always be confronted with is that you can't really push on a string. In other words, if a country doesn't want to spend more money, it's hard to force it to do that. And then it, it, it will perhaps find covered ways to, to pretend it's spending the money, but in, in reality it isn't. So, so it's very hard to push on a string. Uh, so, so helping um, a, a monetary policy via fiscal policy a, um, a, a, um, through a rules-based system that applies to all countries of the area, area is a bit of a challenge. And I think um, we are lucky because there's a third element that your presentation mentioned, but it didn't dwell on it too much. I think there's a third stylized fact, a lot to do with, uh, with climate change, but not only. Um, we live in a world where there is ample opportunity for investment, not least public investment, into things that really pay off in terms of um, increasing uh, economic potential in the future. And why is that useful? Um, I think it's useful because it solves both uh, Eric and Mark, your problem, and Peter's problem. It solves uh, Eric and Mark, your problem, because if you borrow in, a, um, in an uh, um, R minus G um, is negative world, not knowing whether this will last forever, but spend the money on things that really have a very good return in terms of growth potential, then you insure yourselves against the interest rate reversal and you're fine. So to the extent that we can, if we, for example, tackle the climate challenge using the extra flexibility, R minus G, we're pro if the money is spent well, of course, then the quality of public finances creeps back in, it's a pretty good deal. And in the European context, uh, Peter, uh, while it's difficult to push on a string, if we have a consensus, as we seem to be having in the EU, that spending money on this great transformation, it's, it's really an enormous modernization push to get uh, uh, the, the, the climate issue right and to combine it with uh, investment, uh, perhaps in, in, in some additional areas, including areas where, you know, through human capital investment, one can also do a, a lot, not only 
only for productivity, but for equity in societies, um, then I think uh, it is quite likely um, that uh, um, countries will voluntarily um, do what is necessary in order to support monetary policy at the zero lower bound. And so I think if we add this third element of investments being out there, where I think a consensus is shaping up that this is something we require. Um, if we have a, 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 a if a rule, if it's a rule or, or broad-based strategy that rests on three legs: the R minus G leg, the uh, uh, um, zero lower bound leg, and the um, investing um, in, in, into a yet better future leg. I think it's much likely that we will end up in a stable and uh, consensual and um, broadly supported so that we, you know, it's not that at every election in every European country, we have to worry whether this will, <laughs> this will, uh, will, will, uh, will work. Uh, stable, macroeconomically stable, politically stable, um, and offering us a brighter future. Um, so in that sense, progressive package. And so I, I would very much hope, and that's really my, my, my closing, plea that in the sessions that are to follow this idea of, of, of you know taking these three elements together is, is taken seriously and hopefully uh, will help us uh, improve on, 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 the, on the framework of, of fiscal rules that we have today. Thank you very much. Excellent, Jakob. Thank you so much. Um, there were quite a few challenges for you, Eric and, and Mark, to, to, to get back to. Um, I just wanted to say, if anyone in the audience has a question, you can, you can type that into the Q&A or the chat function. And, um, and I, can, I can read it out, um, although mindful of the time that we don't have that much left. Um, Eric, Mark, should we go in reverse order? Um, yeah. Mark first, yeah, I mean, and then Eric? Excellent, excellent. excellent. Mark, yes. why don't you start? Sure. Ex excellent comments. I mean, we do want to revise this, and these are just right, really, really good uh, points. I'm just going to take one part of each of them because I think it, they're, they're the most important for my own way of thinking about this. So, as, as usual, Peter Peter is smarter than me and comes up with a measure, which is the differential between the interest rate and the inflation rate, as an alternate that unifies the fiscal and monetary framework. And I'm like, well, that's, that actually really works. I'm not sure this really replaces it, but I think that it is getting along the same lines to it. Um, where I would sort of push back a little bit is to take something that Jakob just said is, you know, some countries, they may have the fiscal space, but they're not going to overspend. And I do think that part of what we've got lying around in our head here, and it's always been a problem in the Eurozone, is the ability to talk about moral hazard on the one hand and solidarity on the other, thereby poisoning both of them. So the, the idea that politicians are runaway spenders just, you know, has never really been true. Adam Tooze put this well when he says, you know, the notion of the heroic central banker who held back the democratic hordes who were going to bankrupt the state really wasn't true the minute that the 68ers turned in their uh, radicalism for pension plans and housing assets. So it may not be the case that even if you have that fiscal space, it leads to inevitably to runaway spending. And I think if we keep that moral hazard framework there as the primary thing, it really makes it difficult to do anything along the lines that Jakob is suggesting, which I wholeheartedly agree with, as the way to push this forward through the investment side of things. In terms of Veronique, this is exactly what I said to Eric when we were writing the paper. Italy is in permanent austerity if we impose this framework. And therefore, you need something like an expanded uh, next-gen fund or some other investment fund and a way of altering what constitutes the primary balance, et cetera, in terms of spending to make that work. And then the legitimate question is how much of this is kind of moving the accounting framework around to make things look better than they are. My only sort of response to that is to say, well, the current framework doesn't work either. So Italy still isn't growing and BTPs are basically being as held as ward of court by the ECB. And we do have a long-term problem there, which is, a very, very, very large bond market with suppressed rates has been held together by central bank intervention. So whatever we come up with, Italy is a problem, but ours probably doesn't help Italy per se, and you're quite right to point that out. 
And then my last point, again, is exactly on Jakob's point that, yes, the, the climate change and investment and the long term payoff, that's exactly how to think about this. And I wish that we thought about, as you said, it's implicit in the paper. We don't develop it. We should. And it's exactly what we need to do. And Europe is actually the one part of the world where we really see good movement in this direction. So we should maximize and double down on that. But again, I would simply say that for that to happen, the current rules need to go. It would be it's still really hard to do that within the current not just the uh, framework of fiscal rules themselves but the intellectual framework that still holds those rules as being the appropriate way to do things having sort of 60 percent debt to G T debt to gdp levels as long-term targets when you're facing a climate emergency is not a good set of rules so whatever we do needs to push beyond that i'll now pass to eric Right. Well, I just really thank you all very much. Those are really interesting and really helpful points. Maybe if I just quickly address the sort of some, some, some straw men, I, I think obviously in terms of G, we have in mind a trend G, you know, that will, you know, and that, that remains a question. Um, so th th there shouldn't be anything pro-cyclical about what we're describing here, because if you bear in mind that what we're suggesting is when R is greater than G, you have effectively a Ren Lewis Porter's rule, which is actually a, a, a rolling average allowing you to, it's a standard fiscal rule, which is allowing you to be aggressively counter cyclical as long as you're still consistent into the medium term with, with stabilizing the debt to GDP ratio. Um, the other point, I, I think though, Peter made a more fundamental point, which is a fair one, is that this rule would appear to have a bias where your, your, your debt GDP ratio can only go up. That's obviously assuming you don't elect to do otherwise. I think there is a legitimate area of discussion, and Mark, Mark and I need to think about this: is what do you do as your what is your rule when when R is below G? And it may well be to kind of square this circle here, and this links to what Jakob was saying, and Mark has just reiterated that actually your structural increases in debt should be for capital expenditure, in which case you can then look at net assets of the state and you might have stable net assets, but you can get, you know, what we all agree on, which is you have cleared the, the runway to allow the state exploit its cost of capital to do a lot of fixed asset investment. Now, Veronique made a lot of really good points. The, 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 I, I would say, I, I think if you, if, if you look carefully, and this is an area that we need to clarify, we, are, we, are, we absolutely want this rule to be, uh, to be counter cyclical and not pro cyclical, that, that absolutely. The, the point of Italy, I'm afraid though, and I, I just want to stress really what Mark has said is we've got a problem, is the answer. Because if you really believe, so BT, 10 year BTP is now currently around 1%, if you think Italian trend nominal GDP growth is sub 1%, we've got a problem. <laughs> because I can do whatever you want with a fiscal rule. I can't get out of the arithmetic of that. Because if you're saying with a secular collapse in real interest rate structures, I still have an interest rate above nominal GDP growth. Well, uh, you know, the, 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 it, the, the spreadsheet just looks terrible, right? Um, so, so in a sense, um, you know, but now I make just a final point really is, is that, uh, don't give up on this too quickly because we need a rule. I, I still think it's too much to say to the European population and the political class, we're going to go from having had rules to having no rules at all. And bear in mind, this is the operable rule. This is why we've all changed our view on fiscal space. And this is also how market discipline works. You know, as a market participant, I'm looking at Italy going, you've got a problem now. And Europe needs to tackle that problem. And we might as well, we should be clear about it. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Um, I'm conscious of time considering that the next session uh, was uh, supposed to start at, at 3 p.m. Berlin time sharply. So I think I will leave it at that because it set the stage perfectly for the, for the next discussion. Um, I, I thank Eric and Mark for their for their input, and uh, Veronique, um, Jakob, and Peter for their for the discussion. And I'm very much looking forward to the next two sessions, which are on German fiscal policy and uh, our Schuldenbremse um, and and Europe's fiscal rules. Thank you so much for joining us in this session. I have a lovely coffee break of now four minutes, and I hand over to Thomas for this break. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>